Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Sorrell, and I'm the Executive Director of the UCI Anti-Cancer Challenge. Thank you all so much for joining us. If you'd like to ask a question during today's session, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Next slide, please. Our moderator for today's webinar on sarcomas is Dr. Russell Stitzlein. Next slide. Dr. Stitzlein is an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and chief of the Orthopedic Oncology and Sarcoma Surgery Division. He also serves as the Associate Residency Program Director for Orthopedic Surgery. He received his medical degree from Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine in 2012. He completed his orthopedic surgery residency at the University of Pennsylvania in 2017, followed by a fellowship in musculoskeletal oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in 2018. He was recruited to UCI out of fellowship and has been integral in developing our comprehensive sarcoma program. His clinical efforts have been recognized year after year as he has been awarded as a Southern California Super Doctor Rising Star in 2021 and 2022. His clinical expertise is the management of benign and malignant bone and soft tissue tumors, where he has the largest sarcoma surgical practice in Orange County at the only National Cancer Institute designated cancer center in the region. He is involved in numerous multidisciplinary clinical and research efforts working towards improved care for sarcoma patients. He also serves as a peer reviewer for multiple cancer-related specialty journals. I'll now turn the program over to Dr. Stitzlein. Thank you for the uh, kind introduction, Jen. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm Dr. Stitzlein, the, uh, one of the orthopedic oncologists here at UC Irvine. Uh, and I have the pleasure to moderate today's session and uh, introduce you to a couple of uh, my colleagues and, and friends who help take care of our sarcoma patients here at UCI. Since I joined uh, UCI in 2018, uh, we've, we've had a really an explosion in the uh, sarcoma program and, and now truly have a comprehensive team to take care of the patients with these very complex and rare uh, uh, tumors. <clears throat> The, uh, the best way to kind of encapsulate this is really to explain you know, how much uh, we've added to the team since I started. Uh, and the team involves multiple different specialties and we all get together uh, every week to go over cases at our tumor board. And at that tumor board, um, we have uh, myself as well as our other orthopedic oncologist, uh, Dr. Golden. Uh, we have uh, medical oncology represented uh, with Dr. Chow, who you'll meet later, and another of his colleagues. We have our radiation oncologists, as well as our pathologists. Uh, and um, I, with our sarcoma team, we also have representatives from interventional radiology and plastic surgery, who also join us to discuss these patients uh, and, and help us come up with uh, the best plan to treat all of our patients. Uh, <clears throat> As we mentioned, uh, UCI, the Chow Comprehensive Cancer Center, is the only NCI-designated cancer center in Orange County, and that positions us uniquely uh, to take care of these patients, as well as be involved in some of the cutting-edge clinical trials and research that will uh, hopefully go on to change uh, uh, how we're able to take care of patients in the future to just continue to improve the outcome. Uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Chow. He is a clinical professor in the Division of Hematology Oncology here at UC Irvine. He's the Associate Director for Clinical Sciences at the, the Chow Family Comprehensive Cancer Center and the Chow Family Endowed Chair in Clinical Research. Dr. Chow receives, uh, has received several honors and awards, including Castle Connolly, America's Top Doctor, and Castle Connolly's America's Top Doctors for Cancer and best uh, doctors in America. Dr. Chow received his medical degree from the University of Health Sciences, Chicago Medical School in 1986. He completed his residency in internal medicine at Cedar sinai Medical Center, uh, including serving as chief resident and clinical instructor of medicine at the University of California, Los Angeles in 1990. He joined the Department of Medical Oncology at City of Hope after completing his combined fellowship in hematology and medical oncology there in 1994. 
He remained there until September 2021, when we were lucky enough to recruit him here to UCI. Dr. Chow has completed many clinical and translational research trials and has received multiple grants and research supports for his basic translational and clinical research. These include trials funded by the National Cancer Institute, the Food and Drug Administration, Sarcoma Alliance for Research through Collaboration Consortium, and multiple pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies. These trials range from first in human phase one trials through global phase three trials. He specializes in the treatment and management of soft tissue and bone sarcomas and melanomas. He holds numerous uh, or holds membership in numerous professional organizations, including the American Society of Clinical Oncology, the American Association for Cancer Research, Sarcoma Alliance uh, for Research Through Collaboration, and the National Comprehensive Cancer Center Bone Cancer Guidelines Committee, where he previously served as vice chair. He was also co-chair of the Elsevier uh, Bio-Oncology Guidelines Sarcoma Committee. He has authored or co-authored over 800 peer-reviewed publications, and he currently serves on the editorial board for scientific reports. Plus one and faculty of a thousand, as well as serving as ad hoc reviewer for numerous cancer related journals, including cancer research, clinical cancer research, and the Journal of Clinical Oncology. As you can see, he's uh, very well versed in oncology, uh, in, in specifically sarcoma oncology, and is uh, we're lucky enough today to have him here to present uh, uh, some basic background information on sarcomas, as well as some of the new uh, research that he's been involved with and kind of where we're headed in the future with sarcoma management. Thank you, Dr. Chow. Thank you, Russ, for that kind introduction. And in another 30 years, I might have 800 uh, um, manuscripts, but uh, it's around 90 right now. So anyway, um, my um, role today as, as a, a speaker for medical oncology for sarcoma is, is what do we do um, uh, in addition to surgery and or radiation. So here's my outline. Um, what are sarcomas? Who develops uh, sarcomas? How do we traditionally treat sarcomas? And what are the newest updates on treatment? And how, uh, perhaps how can you help um, improve uh, sarcoma outcomes through the uh, UCI anti-cancer challenge? Next slide. So uh, sarcomas have been known since the you know, the Greek ages, um, the, the word sarcoma is derived from the Greek word sarx, meaning flesh. So um, sarcomas are cancers that arise from a connective tissue, transformed connective tissue. That is fat, muscle, bone, cartilage, nerve linings, even blood vessels. Um, so they're traditionally divided into two types, either soft tissue sarcoma, which are the more common, um, or bone sarcomas if they arise from the bone. And so it's estimated that it will be a little over 13,000 new cases in the United States in 2022, which is uh, unfortunately less, well, which is fortunately less than 1% of all cancers. So um, breast cancer is about 290,000, prostate 270,000, lung um, a little over 230,000. So this is truly an orphan disease. Uh, unfortunately, it is also a lethal disease. Um, there will be um, over 5,100 deaths associated with the sarcoma. And so that cal uh, calculates the accrued mortality rate about 39%. You can see the accrued mortality rates for uh, prostate and breast are in the teens. Bone sarcomas, a um, little over 3,900. Um, it's, it's actually a more deadly disease. Um, there will be 2,100 estimated deaths with a for a crude mortality rate of 54%. And that falls somewhere between um, colon and lung cancer um, mortality and um, one of our most lethal diseases, pancreatic cancer. Next slide. So who, do, who gets sarcomas? So sarcomas unfortunately disproportionately affect younger individuals. So um, the NCI has defined children as uh, age zero to 14, adolescents 15 to 19 years old, and young adults are 20 to 39. And so in the decade of the 90s, sarcomas accounted for 11% of all cancers in children and adolescents. And it turns out it is the fourth most uh, common cancer in young adults, again, individuals 20 to 39. Next slide. So I, just to put a face uh, on uh, who this affects, um, 
several months ago, um, uh, there was quite a bit of news regarding this, uh, this gentleman, Virgil uh, Abloh. He is the artistic director for Louis Vuitton's menswear collection. And he is also founder and CEO of um, Off-White Fashion House. Um, I don't know these, uh, um, but my kids uh, um, always uh, uh, know these uh, types of uh, clothes and of course this individual. And unfortunately he was diagnosed and succumbed to um, this cardiac uh, angiosarcoma within one year of diagnosis. Next slide. So as I said, soft tissue sarcomas are the more common of the two. Um, the uh, problem with sarcomas is, is and particularly soft tissue sarcomas is they're actually very, very different. Um, and there are actually more than 70 different types of um, soft tissue sarcomas. You can see um, they're divided. This is from the WHO classification, the World Health Organization classification. So, um, and unfortunately, new ones will probably arise that we haven't heard of yet. And this is due to um, all our new genomic technology. Next slide. So where do they present? Well, they can present anywhere in the body, um, but 45% uh, um, present in either the upper extremity or the lower extremity with uh, about a third being in the lower extremity. And the rest are, are distributed throughout the rest of the body in the abdomen, um, the area behind the abdomen called the retroperitoneum, in the trunk, which is in your chest, um, uh, in, in viscera, um, and other sites, primarily in the head and neck. Um, next slide. So how do we treat soft tissue sarcoma? So that's, is traditionally a surgically managed disease. So Dr. Stisline keeps very busy with, with surgery as well as his colleagues in both orthopedic um, um, oncology as well as um, um, uh, sarcoma oncology, um, surgical oncology. Um, Radiation uh, is, can be an integral part in many sarcomas. And I'll discuss the role for uh, what I do, which is chemotherapy or immunotherapy. Next slide. So um, up to about 2012, um, many of us in, who give chemotherapy offered chemotherapy after a surgery to try to prevent recurrence. So that's called adjuvant chemotherapy. Um, and the chemotherapy used were two drugs called doxorubicin and ifosamide. Doxorubicin is a very old drug. It's nearly 60 years old. Ifosamide is nearly 40 uh, years um, old, um, discovered. And um, the response rate for each is, is in the teens. Um, doxorubicin, about 14%. Ifosamide, about 12 or 13%. And together, um, when I say response rate, uh, this is for advanced sarcomas where surgery is not possible, the response rate is uh, 27%. So the, together, though, that's our, our most effective chemotherapy for patients with advanced or recurrent disease. And so um, the Europeans, the European Organization for Research of Treatment through, of Cancer, EORTC, led a, a trial that lasted many years. Uh, they accrued um, 350 patients, which is um, the largest um, uh, trial, um, uh, randomized um, trial ever um, um, performed for um, adjuvant treatment of sarcomas. And they gave five cycles of this intensive chemotherapy, doxorubicin and ifosamide, um, to, uh, to half the patients. The other half the patients um, were randomized to observation. So nothing else was done. They were just observed. Um, the uh, lenograstum is a um, it's a supportive medicine that helps boost up your blood count, your white blood cell count after chemotherapy to keep you from your immune system um, um, supported. Um, so that's not a true chemotherapy, it's one of our supportive medications. So 350 patients uh, were randomized, half got chemotherapy for five cycles and half didn't after definitive surgery or definitive surgery and radiation. And this was reported in 2012. You can see in the first graph where it says, OS, that's overall survival. So in um, uh, red is the control arm where they received no chemotherapy, they were just observed. In blue arm is chemotherapy, they received five cycles. There was really no difference in, in the overall survival. So the survival curves looked exactly the same. 
Uh, the next curve is RFS, a recurrence-free survival. Again, absolutely no difference. Uh, the uh, two bottom ones, uh, LRR, LRR is a uh, local uh, recurrent relapse. So uh, did it change um, uh, if the tumor came back locally uh, at the site of where it presented? It did not. And then on the final uh, quadrant, on the uh, right lower quadrant is uh, uh, patients uh, who um, develop metastasis. And again, there was no difference. And generally when a sarcoma metastasizes, it metastasizes hematogenously, meaning through the bloodstream and not the lymph nodes. So the first stop when, when it's spread through hematologously is in the lungs. So more than 90% of metastases first present uh, in the lungs. So there was really no difference. So in 2012, um, this really changed how we practice um, sarcoma medical oncology. And so the majority of physicians don't offer chemotherapy after um, surgery based on this very large uh, um, global European trial. Uh, next slide. So um, for patients, uh, we, we can cure about 50% of patients with, um, up, uh, with uh, localized sarcomas um, and with multimodality care, which is generally surgery and or radiation. Unfortunately, the other 50% uh, will develop metastasis. And uh, unfortunately, there's no curative treatment for patients with advanced sarcoma. That means it has spread the lungs uh, or elsewhere um, without surgery. Um, so you can do surgery to remove the metastasis in the lung, and that's called a pulmonary metastastectomy. Um, if you cannot uh, do the, that type of, of surgery. Uh, unfortunately, your survival is um, poor. At two years, it's less than 25%. At five years, it's less than 10%. However, if you can successfully do a pulmonary metastasectomy to remove the metastasis from the lung, uh, for soft tissue sarcomas, you have about a 25% chance of a long-term survival. Um, and uh, that survival uh, may include multiple uh, surgeries to remove um, tumors in the lungs, but you're uh, are alive. Um, and I've seen patients undergo 10, 11 pulmonary metastasectomy surgeries throughout their 15 and 20 year survival. Next slide. So um, um, absent chemotherapy, what else is there? Um, a drug uh, was developed, um, it's a pill called bazopinib. Um, also known, the trade name is Votrian. Um, what it does is it um, targets a new blood vessel formation. So it's called an anti-angiogenic agent. Um, it's like, think of it as kicking a garden hose. Um, so you um, starve the tumor of its blood supply. But unfortunately, what happens um, if you kink a garden hose is pressure backs up behind it. And so one of the, mo the, the most common uh, side effect of this is hypertension, but we have many uh, good antihypertensive medications nowadays for this. So bazopinib, the, the PLET trial is a global randomized phase three trial for soft tissue sarcomas with the exception of liposarcoma versus uh, fat sarcoma. They were randomized in a two to one fashion to this oral drug uh, pill, bazopinib, or a placebo pill. Um, and you can see on the uh, curves, on the top curve, the progression-free the progression survival, meaning that these were patients who had pulmonary metastasis predominantly. They were not amenable to a pulmonary metastasectomy. And so they received, and they failed chemotherapy in this trial before. Um, and so the eligible patients had failed chemotherapy. So uh, they were offered pazopinib or this placebo pill. And you can see that the progression-free survival for the green curve, which is pazopinib, is uh, significantly better than the placebo um, trial. So on average, the median progression-free survival was four and a half months for bazopinib versus one and a half months for um, placebo. And based upon um, this data, the um, um, uh, drug bazopinib was approved by the Food and Drug Administration in 2012. In the lower curve is the overall survival. The upper curve is um, uh, survival without progression of disease, and the bottom curve is um, whether you are alive or not uh, at those selected time points. Um, so the median overall survival wasn't significant, 
what the median progression free survival was. Next slide. Um, here's the uh, newest um, uh, attempt at immunotherapy for sarcomas. So this is a, uh, uh, a pilot study of genetically engineered NYESO1, specific NYESO1, um, 259T, which is T cells in HLA-A2 positive patients with synovial sarcomas. So it's a long title, but synovial sarcomas um, represent about 20% of all soft tissue sarcomas in young patients. They have a, a characteristic uh, um, genetic chromosome translocation called the and translocation X18. Um, it's uh, um, more sensitive to chemotherapy than the other can uh, sarcomas, be, and particularly since it becomes in younger individuals, uh, we, we can treat them more aggressively. But unfortunately, if it recurs, it's still the prognosis is poor. So this protein or tumor antigen is called NYESO1, New York uh, esophageal uh, squamous um, antigen 1 uh, expression is, is observed in this um, protein is observed on the surface of sarcoma, these synovial sarcomas in over two thirds of cases. Um, and, and the investigators at the National Cancer Institute um, led by Steven Rosenberg, uh, a surgical oncologist there, um, uh, made a T cell receptor um, that recognizes this protein, this tumor antigen uh, in the context of, of your tissue type, which is HLA AO, 201, um, and they um, put it into a, a viral vector, uh, a virus, a retrovirus, and then they uh, infected um, or um, exposed uh, patients' T cells um, that were harvested from the patients. And then uh, these super, now super T cells that recognize this NYESO1 can now hone in uh, on these synovial sarcomas that uh, express this um, tumor antigen. So uh, O2, this HLA is, is a tissue type. That's when you do a, um, a heart transplant, lung transplant, kidney transplant, you match their tissue. And so this, this you have to match the tissue um, with this HLA AO2-1. And about 50% of the Caucasian population has HLA AO2-1. Um, it's a little bit less common in ethnic minorities. Next slide. And so this is the process. Um, uh, starting from, from uh, on the left, this, um, the, the cancer cell um, is, uh, um, you can see, um, is, is has this NYSO1, uh, the little blue um, is, is on, um, is, is being presented by the cancer cell. And these, uh, the super T cells called LED-A cell, autologous T cell in the upper uh, left-hand corner recognizes this protein, um, attacks uh, the cancer cell, and you can see that the cancer cell is now showed up and dying. So um, the process is, is you um, harvest the patient's uh, T cells. Um, they're called freeze, you freeze them. You sit in um, next to a machine, a catheter goes in um, one, um, vein and, and then is returned in another vein. Uh, we filter out the, the T cells. Um, we then um, take those T cells. Um, th then we infect them with uh, a retrovirus uh, that has this um, uh, T cell receptor, this, uh, this hybrid T cell receptor. It grows up over a period of about 30 days. Um, and then we bring the patient back um, and then we give them high doses of lymphodepletion chemotherapy, meaning that we have to give them chemotherapy that knocks out their native uh, T cells um, so that it will provide room for the, our, these super T cells to uh, come in and re-expand and now then recognize and kill the um, cancer cells. So this is a long drawn out process, but this is the, the cutting edge of, of um, uh, sarcoma therapy um, for synovial, sar um, synovial sarcoma. So uh, that's what we're kind of doing right now. Um, and it's undergoing a, a, a evaluation by the FDA for approval here in the next year or two. Next slide. So um, I'll end up with uh, bone sarcomas. Um, again, bone sarcomas are less common. Um, 
So uh, there are typically three types of bone sarcomas um, versus chondrosarcomas, which is derived from the cartilage. Um, these typically uh, occur in uh, slightly older adults and it can occur in any bone. Uh, the next one is osteosarcoma. Uh, this is the, the most common sarcoma in children and AYA um, or adult, um, adolescent young adults, um, primarily in 10 to 30 and it occurs typically in the ends of long bones. And then the least most common is a Ewing sarcoma. Uh, this occurs again in, in um, the first and second decade of life. It typically presents in the middle of long bones or also in the exoskeleton, which is the, the, your back um, or pelvis. But it can also develop in, uh, outside the bone and it's called an extraosseous uh, Ewing sarcoma. Uh, next slide. So chondrosarcomas uh, uh, are typically kind of the most um, um, uh, indolent uh, of them. So uh, um, the most common is called a conventional chondrosarcoma. It accounts for 90% of all chondrosarcomas. Um, potential, the, the grade threes, which fortunately only account for up to 10% of conventional chondrosarcomas have a high metastatic potential. Um, and notably, uh, they have a mutation, a genetic mutation in something called iso, uh, isocitrate dehydrogenase gene. It's a metabolic gene uh, that's part of the Krebs cycle and occurs in nearly 90% of all cases. Why is that important? Well, um, there are, there's a drug approved for acute myelogenous leukemia that targets IDH1, so it's called avocetinib. Um, and a colleague of mine, um, uh, William Tapp, uh, at Memorial led a trial looking at this drug um, uh, for uh, off-label use for this in chondrosarcomas. Um, although there were no responses, it tended to keep the tumors from growing on the average of about six months. So uh, it's not a home run, but uh, something that's novel that uh, uh, can work. Um, much less common are these other um, types of d differentiated chondrosarcoma. So this is a, a, a typically a what starts out as a conventional chondrosarcoma, but the longer it stays there, it has chances of developing secondary mutations. And when it develops with secondary mutations, it can look like an osteosarcoma or OS, uh, a malignant fibrous histiocytoma, now known as uh, uh, undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. Uh, so it, it has uh, a conventional, um, very low grade looking tumor. And then right next to it is this very high grade tumor that looks like a bone cancer or a soft tissue sarcoma. Um, and um, when I was part of the NCCN, um, you know, we had recommended that uh, you should treat these with uh, osteosarcoma type chemotherapy. Um, uh, le less common than that is a mesenchymal chondrosarcoma. It's, uh, it's also a biomorphic tumor. Uh, instead of the um, uh, high-grade osteosarcoma or UPS sarcoma, um, um, it looks like a Ewing sarcoma right next to the conventional um, uh, chondrosarcoma areas. And so because it looks like that, um, Ewing sarcoma chemotherapy is, has been uh, generally recommended. Um, and um, the clear cells um, chondrosarcoma is a very, very rare one. It's a very indolent um, and generally curable. Uh, next slide. So osteosarcomas uh, are, what are the most common bone sarcomas in children and at, uh, AYA. Um, the majority are um, uh, developed from within the bone cavity, the uh, intramedullary area. Uh, and of those, those are all generally high grade. Um, and importantly, chemotherapy does work in this uh, entity. So multi-agent chemotherapy has improved survival from uh, 15% in the um, late 70s and early 80s when chemotherapy was not uh, uh, offered to nearly 70% um, in this uh, present uh, day and age. Um, so chemotherapy is a very important part. Uh, um, surface, it can also develop on the cortex or the surface of um, uh, the bone. And if it's a low grade, it's called a parosteal when we don't give chemotherapy. Um, it can be an intermediate grade or periosteal periosteal, and then consensus now is to offer chemotherapy for this intermediate grade, but uh, these are much less common, and there are some very rare subtypes. Next slide. 
how we end up with uh, Ewing sarcoma. Um, Ewing sarcoma, the second most common bone sarcoma in children AYA. Um, it tends to develop in the middle of the bone versus the ends of the bone, what osteosarcoma. Here it's characterized by a chromosome uh, translocation uh, called the EWSFLI1. Um, and interestingly, about uh, up to 20% can develop uh, outside the bone. Um, and on the right is a, um, X -ray, a CT scan of a, a young woman with um, uh, extra osseous or outside the bone um, Ewing sarcoma that I managed who presented to me at 33 weeks of uh, pregnancy. Um, she delivered and we successfully treated her with chemotherapy uh, and radiation and she did well. Um, and importantly, multi-agent chemotherapy has also improved this. So chemotherapy is very important. It's improved survival from 15% in the pre-chemotherapy era to actually uh, 83% in the most recent large um, um, Ewing's uh, clinical trial. Next slide. And I'll end up with um, our plug for the UCI Anti-Cancer Challenge that was established in 2017 by my boss, uh, Richard Van Etten. He's the director of the Child Family Conference of Cancer Center. 100% of the money uh, raised goes to promising cancer research. Um, and we've raised uh, uh, more than $2.6 million since its uh, inception. Um, and we will be in person for this uh, Anti-Cancer Challenge bike ride in 2022, and I believe it will be in October. And with that, I thank you for your attention. I'll um, introduce um, the next speaker, Dr. Jeremy Harris. He is my colleague in radiation oncology. He's an assistant professor and clinician investigator with primary uh, clinical interests in lung um, cancer, sarcoma, spine tumors, and head and neck cancer. And Dr. Harris has been the director of radiation, uh, thoracic radiation oncology since 2019. Uh, he has an impressive uh, resume. He graduated from Johns, Ho Johns Hopkins with a degree in chemical and biochemical uh, engineering. He completed a master's in chemistry at Cambridge University. Uh, he uh, complete, completed medical school at uh, Stanford University, and he stayed on there for his uh, um, residency in radiation oncology. And we were lucky enough to recruit him about two years ago um, to um, UC Irvine. Uh, his uh, uh, research uh, uh, focuses on treatment of lung cancer, sarcomas, um, and spine tumors. Um, his endeavors are focused on the combination of newer radiation treatment techniques and technologies um, uh, combined with systemic therapies and ablative therapies to improve the outcomes of patients with cancer. Um, as a faculty member at UC Irvine, um, Dr. Harrison received funding for his investigating initiated trials focusing on novel treatments of lung cancer as well as sarcomas, and importantly, um, he has received funding uh, from the Anti-Cancer Challenge, um, uh, this entity, for his uh, novel uh, treatment of um, sarcomas with radiation. So uh, with further, uh, no further ado, I will introduce Dr. Jeremy Harris. Thank you very much, Dr. Chow. Um, really appreciate the kind introduction. Thank you for the really fantastic overview of sarcoma management in general, as well as uh, some of the cutting edge research that's going on in the field. Thanks, Dr. Stitzlein for hosting and moderating. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Uh, next slide. So I'm a radiation oncologist. Radiation therapy plays an important role in the management for sarcoma, but only for um, a small portion of patients. As Dr. Chow had mentioned, sarcomas um, can be a very dangerous disease. Um, there are approximately 13,000 of these um, who, patients who present in the US each year. About 80% have soft tissue sarcomas, meaning those that are not bone sarcoma. And he showed you a very nice description of where those are tend to be located. Um, and of the soft tissue sarcomas, as a radiation oncologist, we're particularly interested in those um, in the non-abdominal uh, area, and uh, that's about 80% of the soft tissue sarcomas. Next slide. We know that radiation plays a very important role for some patients with sarcoma. 
And it tends to be those that are at higher risk for recurring after just surgery. Um, those sarcomas tend to be the larger ones, five centimeters or greater. Um, it tends to be those that are higher grade um, and those are graded on a one through three scale and it's those that are grade two or grade three. Um, when tumors have already come back, um, so they've so-called recurred, we know that they're at high risk for coming back again. Those that are taken out without previously knowing that they might be a sarcoma are at high risk for coming back without additional radiation therapy. Um, and those that are taken out uh, surgically and despite best efforts have a margin that is involved with sarcoma are at very high risk for coming back. Next slide. We've been using radiation therapy from the management of these soft tissue sarcomas for decades. And actually in the 1980s, uh, the NIH, the National Cancer Institute, ran a clinical trial randomizing patients to doing radiation therapy or not. The, in this trial, um, patients with any type of soft tissue sarcoma were included. All of these patients had chemotherapy. And the chance that the tumor recurred many years later without radiation for all comers was approximately 30%. And when radiation was used as an adjuvant modality, it really cut down the chance that the cancers recurred to less than 5% chance. And so we know from, from these data that radiation is very, very helpful in preventing these recurrences. And that's how we know it plays in a really integral role. Over time, we've learned um, which of these cancers are at highest risk and which ones most benefit from the radiation therapy. Uh, next slide. Now, radiation is a very important modality and helps prevent the cancer from coming back in the area that the tumor uh, originated from. It does not necessarily prevent the cancer from coming back or developing in other parts of the body. So in, in many studies and in, including in that NCI study, um, the rate that cancer might spread to other parts of the body is high, uh, thus it can be a very deadly disease. Um, and the chance that it comes back, whether radiation was given or not, um, can be 20 to 30% uh, long-term. Uh, next, next slide. Uh, the way in which radiation is given um, is continuously evolving. Um, there are many different ways that we've studied this. Uh, we've given radiation before surgery, after surgery. Uh, we've uh, modernized the techniques in delivering radiation um, more focally um, and more uniformly. And we've gotten better at doing it. Um, in 2002, a Canadian randomized study was finally presented that randomized patients doing radiation prior to or after their surgical resection. Um, the chance that the cancer recurred, the local failure rate remained the same, 7 to 8%. Um, but the chance of permanent long-term side effects, and in particular late fibrosis, which is a side effect of the radiation therapy, um, was improved when radiation was given prior to surgery. Uh, so that improved from about 50% to about 30%. And since then, as I'd mentioned, um, the technique of giving radiation uh, has gotten better. Um, so we use something called image guidance or IGRT, um, as well as a, a, a planning technique called uh, IMRT. And with those, both of those, uh, that late fibrosis has been cut down to about five to 10%, um, depending on the area of the body that is treated. Uh, next slide. Um, one of the big cooperative groups in the United States is the NRG. Uh, they run many clinical trials over a variety of different cancers. Um, in sarcoma, they have one study that is ongoing and open, uh, DT001. It is an early investigation, a phase 1B study of radiation combined with the drug AMG232. Uh, doesn't yet have a um, trade name. 
And um, this drug inhibits uh, MDM2, um, which is a protein that we believe to be important um, in the progression of sarcoma. Um, the reason that we think that this could be effective in sarcoma management is from preclinical data, um, mouse data, that shows when um, radiation is given to tumors, this is the upper left plot, the tumors respond, they can shrink and then entirely disappear. And with a certain dose, eventually these tumors will come back. That's how, that's these plots coming back. When the drug, um, one of these MDM2 inhibitors is given, it does not necessarily affect the tumors and they continue to grow. Uh, but there seems to be a synergistic effect when both the drug and the radiation are given together, um, the tumors, um, are eradicated and do not recur. And that's the, um, this plot here, I'm just gonna annotate here. And so this study, um, DT001, is studying a different MDM2 inhibitor combined with radiation therapy. Um, it's nearly done in accruing and we are anticipating um, that uh, results will be available within a year and it could potentially lead to a larger phase two or phase three study. Uh, next slide. As I had mentioned, radiation is given prior to or after surgery, um, and it typically takes five to seven weeks of daily treatment to deliver that radiation. But we've actually known from biologic experiments that uh, such a prolonged course of radiation may not be necessary. We've known this for many years, um, but making that translation from the the uh, bench top into the clinic has been difficult, um, but we do believe that if you compress radiation therapy into a shorter time scale, it may benefit um, oncologically without necessarily causing worse side effects. Next slide. And to that end, there have been some recent studies that have come out that are early um, and from single institutions only. Um, but they seem to show that radiation when cut down to five to 15 fractions rather than, so that would be given in one to three weeks instead of five to seven weeks, um, that the chance that the tumor comes back, the local failure is what would be expected using the standard fractionation and the side effects from the radiation therapy. And in particular, the wound complications from the radiation seems again, comparable to what would be expected from um, standard long course of radiation therapy. And so these are really interesting um, novel approaches to how radiation is given. Um, and we think that it will um, develop into larger clinical trials that would be open across uh, the country in the near future. Next slide. Uh, the potential benefit um, to using short courses of radiation um, may seem obvious, but uh, folks are much more interested and able to travel for uh, shorter treatments, and in particular, if it's given in one week. Um, and that's important since um, radiation therapy is hard to move around. Patients need to come um, from wherever they live to um, a single center. And um, that can be difficult because there's not a lot of centers necessarily that specialize in sarcoma management. And so um, this is one way that could potentially help people who live far away and in more uh, rural areas that are far from cancer centers. Next slide. Um, at UC Irvine, um, we have done some work uh, that I've led with one of our resident physicians. Um, I'm particularly interested in reducing the side effects from radiation therapy and understanding exactly what those side effects are. Um, we know that radiation can cause a drop in blood counts and in particular uh, lymphopenia. And we know that from other cancers that radiation associated lymphopenia um, can be associated with worse cancer outcomes and worse prognosis. And so we've looked at this in our own sarcoma patients who've been treated with radiation over the past decade at UC Irvine um, and found again that 
radiation is associated with lymphopenia. Uh, we've been able to correlate this um, with precisely what, um, how radiation is given and to what areas of the body. Um, and we're hoping eventually that this could lead to changes in how uh, we think about how radiation is given and, and where it's given in the body. So next slide. I wanted to touch on um, my own um, prospective studies as well as the anti-cancer challenge. And um, that comes to immunotherapy for sarcoma management. So um, immunotherapy has by and large not been very effective for the management of most soft tissue sarcomas. Um, one of the largest studies for immunotherapy in sarcoma was SARC-028. And in that study, pembrolizumab was the immunotherapy that was given. The response rate was 18%. Um, and so only a small portion of patients um, had tumors that shrank uh, more than 30%. You can see that most patients, their tumors remain the same or even grew. Uh, next slide. But we know from other cancers, um, such as lung cancer, um, that when pembrolizumab is given alone, um, it can be quite effective. And sometimes when radiation is added as well, it can improve the efficacy of the immunotherapy. Um, this has been tested in head and neck cancer as well. And from that, we know that the less immunogenic types of cancers, um, which is often indicated by um, staining for PDL1, um, that the lower the PDL1 staining, the more effective the radiation therapy is at triggering the, the systemic immunotherapy response. And we believe this has to do with the fact that radiation works um, with the immune system. We know that radiation can prime um, the immune cells, the T cell receptors, um, to rec better recognize cancer cells. Um, and potentially um, prime the immune system to help attack the cancer in other parts of the body. Next slide. Uh, we know that radiation works um, with, in, in collaboration with the immune system since uh, when radiation is given by itself, it can cause tumor shrinkage. Um, and when the immune system is blocked, um, in, in particular by blocking CD8 tumors, uh, um, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, um, that efficacy of radiation is reduced or negated. Next slide. And so that brings me to my own study, um, which is funded through the Anti-Cancer Challenge Grant. Uh, it's UCI 2103, which is very nearly um, open um, for enrollment which is a study of pembrolizumab immunotherapy in, in conjunction with radiation given as SBRT. And the immunotherapy is given for six months and the SBRT is given to a single site of disease. Um, this is for patients who have undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma or undifferentiated sarcomas uh, who have undergone prior systemic therapy and have at least two sites of disease. Uh, we're looking to enroll six patients. Uh, this is a pilot study um, testing the feasibility of doing both immunotherapy with radiation therapy together. Next slide. Uh, radiation is given to one tumor and it is in any part of the body. Um, we allow for mostly one to five fractions of radiation therapy um, with very um, standard typical dosing that would be used uh, from the SBRT side. Next slide. And what we're really interested in is not measuring the efficacy of the radiation uh, at the area that is treated, but measuring the efficacy of the radiation uh, at the areas that are not irradiated. So the response rate at the non-irradiated sites. Um, that's the um, area that is potentially scientifically very interesting um, knowing under better understanding how radiation can prime the immune system. Um, we have some other endpoints that we will be interested in, failure at the irradiated site, uh, how long the response lasts, um, survival outcomes, and 
side effect outcomes. Next slide. Um, I think that's the end of my talk and we're going to begin our uh, Q&A. Thank you. All right, well, thank you again to Dr. Harris and Dr. Chow. It was a wonderful overviews of both sarcomas, some of the treatments, and uh, I can tell you about all the fun parts uh, from their side of things. Obviously, the surgeons, those of us get to take these out, um, which is you know, a long time been a mainstay of the treatment. Uh, but as you can see, it's really a multidisciplinary effort between all of us to decide the best treatment course for each of our patients so that we can give them the best, uh, best chance at long-term survival uh, and uh, to stay away from these tumors coming back. Um, we can transition and answer some of the, uh, the questions from the uh, attendees. Um, and as more come up, please type them in there and we'll try and get through as many as we can. Uh, the first question we have is, do sarcomas run in families? And uh, I'll let Dr. Chow into this. He's been doing this the longest amongst the group of us and, and he, can, uh, he can answer that one. Sure, so there are some rare um, cancer family syndromes that have mutations in um, uh, specific genes. So the, the, most, the, the one um, most common, even though it's still pretty rare, is called leaf Romani syndrome. Um, and th there's a mutation uh, in the P53 gene that uh, Dr. Harris was uh, talking about. That's kind of the, what we call the guardian of the genome. And more than 50% of all cancers have a mutation in P53. But those are um, somatic mutations, meaning that they're not germline. And so these, so the, the mutation uh, for Lee Romani happens uh, in your germline. Um, and so that is autosomal uh, dominant transmission. And so there's a 50% chance of, of passing that on to your, um, your progeny. And but so that it's not just sarcomas, but it's sarcomas, breast cancer, uh, acute leukemia, uh, brain tumors, and uh, adrenal cancers. But it, it's a very rare, um, and even less uh, rarer than that is something called um, um, malignant peripheral um, uh, nerve sheath tumors, which can happen a, a type of sarcoma that happens in nerves, but they and it arises in um, uh, um, a syndrome called. Uh, neurofibromatosis type one, uh, and it's also known as von Recklinghausen's disease. And um, as you may remember from back in the 80s, there was a movie called The Elephant Man, um, and he had von Recklinghausen's diseases. You have multiple cutaneous um, benign neurofibromas, uh, but they, uh, some of them um, can develop into an uh, MPNST tumor. Great. Yeah, thanks. And um, those, uh, those are the ones that run in families that are, um, will present as sarcomas out of, kind of out of the blue. There's a couple other things we see. Some mostly are actually benign bone tumor conditions that can run in families that just have a higher risk of turning into cancers. Uh, and so those are also patients that we, we end up seeing and keeping an eye on a long time too. Um, kind of the dovetails off that was another question about some other risk factors uh, the, the, for someone developing um, a sarcoma. And this is a question that, you know, all, most all the patients will ask or at least wonder about. Um, and there are some risk factors. Um, the, like I mentioned, you know, obviously these things that are genetic things, um, some of the syndromes that involve multiple bone tumors, some of them or some of the soft tissue tumors have a very low chance of turning into cancer. Um, and then I'll let Jeremy talk about, because there's so there's one, one that we see, uh, the Agent Orange, and there's a few kind of environmental exposures, but then Jeremy, I'll let him answer, which is our biggest one we worry about since he, he knows about that. That's right. Uh, so radiation therapy or prior radiation exposure um, definitely is a, a big risk factor for developing sarcoma later in life. Um, the most common instance of radiation-induced Sarcoma later is uh, for breast cancer survivors, um, and they tend to develop an angiosarcoma um, of the breast. Um, however, um, any radiation exposure, um, including from uh, uh, medical imaging, as well as uh, where we initially learned about this um, 
which is atomic bomb survivors, can be a risk factor for developing uh, cancer and in particular sarcoma uh, later in life. Very good, thank you. And then we'll do this last question. Um, someone asked about, uh, they have a family member that had a biopsy that was noted as a probable sarcoma. And is it possible to have a sarcoma that's something else? Um, so I'll take that one. And, and I think what this really highlights, and, and I'll give a plug to our team as well, is that sarcomas are rare, they're very complex, and the diagnosis of them is, 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 is critical. So it's critical to make the diagnosis, to make it early, and to, to get to the right teams. Because we, we will see, um, I think the specific situation here is that it, it may be that they're hedging, that they're worried, that it's always, um, the problem is that they're misdiagnosed as something else before they're a sarcoma. When something says probable sarcoma, oftentimes it is a sarcoma. It's more a matter of which type. And as Dr. Chow alluded to, that there's all these different types, uh, some of them that look so bizarre uh, that they don't even look like uh, any, anything that belongs in the body. And it can be very difficult to, uh, uh, to diagnose. So this is the key why especially these masses um, are kind of best evaluated at cancer centers, at academic centers that have the teams, pathology, radiation oncology, medical oncology who are experienced at looking and making these diagnoses as well as is treating them. And the last plug there is that, you know, it, it is actually officially recommended by, you know, the uh, National Cancer Institute um, and, and other cancer organizations that Anything that's a possible sarcoma, uh, be uh, actually biopsied and evaluated at a, a tertiary center due to the risk of them being misdiagnosed uh, if they're not taken care of by people with expertise in the field. So I think we're out of time, unfortunately. Uh, there is another question I can try and type an answer in while they're doing the finish up uh, part to this, but, uh, but thank you to everyone who attended um, today. Um, it, it's my pleasure to moderate Again, two of my friends and colleagues here, Dr. Chow, Dr. Harris, thank you for your expertise. Uh, and thank you to UCI and to the whole team to help uh, with the anti-cancer challenge and with these webinars. Uh, thank you very much for your hard work. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everybody. Well, thank you so much to all of today's speakers. So in closing, if you haven't yet already, we invite you to join the 2022 UCI Anti-Cancer Challenge, which is an annual peer-to-peer -peer fundraising event where participants sign up to ride, run, walk, or volunteer and raise money for cancer research. We do work with corporate partners to underwrite the cost of the event, so 100% of proceeds go directly to cancer research. We're very excited to announce that the sixth annual Anti-Cancer Challenge will take place Saturday, October 8th in UCI's Aldrich Park. It will be a hybrid event with opportunities to participate in person and virtually. Uh, in-person Challenge Day will include a 5K, 10K run walk, a 12, uh, excuse me, 14, 35, 60, or 100 mile bike route an entertainment family-friendly festival and awards. And we're continuing on with our monthly educational webinar series featuring renowned faculty like those who presented with to us today. So next slide. We do hope you'll consider starting, joining, or supporting a team. And again, all proceeds support promising pilot studies and early phase clinical trials that can help prevent, treat, and cure cancer. Next slide. And please join us for a webinar on prostate cancer next month on Thursday, May 26th from 1 to 2 p.m. Next slide. And if you would like to sign up to receive webinar reminders and anti-cancer challenge news, you can either scan a QR code or visit our website. So again, thank you so much and have a wonderful day.